Hello folks, uh, welcome. Let's talk about gate 27 or gene key 27 today. So we're transiting through this from April 23rd to April 28th, 2023. And I mean, if you have this active in your chart or the corresponding gate with this, this might be a familiar energy for you. Um, it's also an opportunity as we look at these transits and we look at these gene keys and gates on the shadow, it's an opportunity to integrate this, right? The more we ignore the shadow, the stronger it gets. Um, the more we can courageously turn towards the shadow and move into it and through it, and through the integration process, it's kind of like um, you devour it and digest it and it comes out as something different. It alchemizes when you turn towards the shadow. So gate 27 on the human design side is in the sacral and it connects to the spleen. And this is in the um, tribal defense circuit or the sustainability circuit. And it's part of, with gate 50, it's part of the channel of preservation, which is the ability to respond to feeding, nourishing, and sustaining um, your people while living aligned with your values that are rooted in love for self and others um, in a sustainable way. And in this gate, we've now moved into the astrological sign of Taurus. And the quantum, light, quantum name for this gate is accountability. And the traditional human design name is responsibility. And the I Ching calls this the hexagram of nourishment. And through some of my contemplation around the I Ching, um, what really came through was that this gate this idea of nourishment is it speaks to what the Tao is it speaks to like it's like this the epitome of Tao which is the ability to nourish self and others and to be natural in the simplicity of life we make life so complicated um, through our minds and nature in itself is very um, simple in its in the way that it moves and so this gate is giving us this opportunity to tap into um, a natural simplicity of caring so the transit is highlighting this ability to care for others, at the same time, allowing others to be responsible for their own challenges and choices. And so it's you're caring, but you're not over caring. You're knowing that people can be responsible for themselves. And it's not your job to be responsible for everyone in your you, responsible for your people. And it's also highlighting for us to work with the feeling of guilt, which is often what has us compromising our own values, our own integrity, and what feels right for you. As A Course in Miracles says, you, um, you treat yourself and the other equally, but and this is kind of how my studies reframed it, but yourself is just a little bit first because you can't take care of others if you don't take care of yourself, right? It's the same old um, when you're in a plane, right? You put your mask on before you help someone else put their masks on if they need oxygen. So on the shadow side of this, um, we get martyrdom, codependency, guilt, and over caring, which then just really just takes us out of ourselves. We are no longer in our own bodies, in our own thoughts, in our own feelings. When we over care, when we um, 
are codependent and when we're in mar when we're living out the archetype of the martyr we're over in other people and so on the integrated side of this it's really about mastering the ability to support and nurture others while doing the same for yourself and to sense what's necessary to support the well-being of others and increase that well-being and then also to hold others accountable to their own self-love and empowerment like knowing that even if this person here is sitting in front of you and they are hurting that they have it in them they are powerful they are a part of the divine they have the answers inside of them they just might need a little help but it doesn't mean you do the work for them um i don't have gate 27 but i do have gate 50 and i have this has been a big lesson in my own life is and how, how i use the integrated version of this um, gate in my sessions with my clients right it's like and, and with my family, right? I know what people need to feel supported. It's very, it comes very natural to me since I've been a child. But what would happen is I swung to the other side where I discounted my own needs. Very, um, it was very, it was a, it, uh, uh, I'm having trouble speaking today. Um, it was, a coping mechanism as a child but I came by it naturally due to this gate 50 and this open gate 27 right and so now I've learned how to take care of myself while also being able to care for others while holding my clients accountable to their own empowerment right they don't need me I'm just here highlighting for them where they might need to look and what they might need to reclaim so on the gene key side of this, Richard Rudd names this gene key food of the gods. And it's about giving is also receiving. And you see this everywhere in nature, right? You see this in forests. You see this in animals, um, just in the natural death and rebirth cycle, right? You see um, in tree networks, right? There are, there are fungus growing in trees that are feeding off the dying trees and the trees are giving this fungus or mushrooms shelter so that they're in a shady spot and can live. The mushrooms are then breaking down the dying, rotting material. And this happens when the salmon are spawning and they're going up the river. And then as they're spawning, they're dying. And all of those nutrients go back into the water, feed the soil, the eagles get fed, uh, the bears get fed and a whole lot of other opportunistic animals, right? It's all about giving and receiving. On the shadow side of this, we, we see this gene key named selfishness. And it's selfish because in a way it's about, it's funny because we think of selfish on the more egotistical standpoint where it's like all I'm doing is thinking of me but there's another side of selfishness and that is like giving self up self-sacrificing where we give away personal power or energy or we give without any sense of boundary right every archetype has a has a um a duality in it and when we are self-sacrificing in our selfishness, we're actually looking for something. We're looking to fulfill our value, our worth, um, to feel lovable. And when we're self-sacrificing without any sense of boundary, this can lead to resentment or it can lead to being taken advantage of and then feeling depleted and burnt out and angry. And 
it is also deeply rooted in this, in the emotion of guilt, right? Guilt is a very driving force in our world that um, kind of gets us to do things that aren't in alignment with us. And so in this self-sacrificing, if someone is sacrificing their own values because they think they should do something for other, often there is a guilt energy emotion attached to that. And so when you're giving from a place of guilt, it's not coming from your true heart. It's coming from a lower frequency energy that is going to have what um, my very first counselor used to say, it's going to have a hook in it. When we, when we are self-sacrificing, there is often a feeling of wanting to get something in return, right? Proving your value, proving your lovability. So there's that hook there. And whether they know it or not, the person that you're giving to from guilt feels that on some level. The other side of selfishness is being self-centered, and that's giving with an agenda. And I would say that self-sacrificing is also giving with an agenda, but you're less aware of it because it's covered up by that um, coping mechanism of martyrdom, right? So when you're self-centered, you kind of have more of a perhaps, perhaps not, but you're a little bit more conscious of how you're going to give and then what you're going to receive in return. And we find this a lot in our political world where, where um, there's a lot of manipulation and distrust. Oh, I will say these words and then you will donate to my party, right? And in this self-centered energy too, there is also a reactivity of anger. So instead of guilt being there, there is anger. And instead of giving from the place of guilt, you're giving from your mind, you're strategizing. Okay, so how do you journey from selfishness to the gift of altruism? So, I mean, one of the places I most go is you, you, you turn towards nature, right? You, you look towards the Tao where all of these original teachings, the root of them come from. And you, you, you begin to notice what's, what's happening in the, in nature and how is giving occurring, right? You reconnect to the earth. It's also really important to challenge your expectations so and where your expectations come from. So to question yourself and go, hmm, is there a hook in my giving right now? If I go and do this thing for this person, am I doing it out of guilt or am I doing it because there's an, I have an expectation that I will receive something in return? And so I would encourage you to start asking yourself that question. If you start to feel a sense of obligation or guilt around something, ask yourself, is there a hook in this for me? Do I feel like I should? Um, am I hoping to get something in return? And then, you know, you can watch yourself play that out. I know as I transitioned through this, um, I really watched this play out a few times. I actually had to go through the motions and feel what it's like. I mean, I'm a th three line, so it takes, I do have to practice things many times to really get a full embodied experience of that. Um, but if you watch that, watch thing out for yourself, I'm guilty if I don't do this thing, then what will they think of me? And this is a part where you get to support yourself, right? Because this is about care for self and others equally. So this gift of altruism, you're going to find this, um, as Richard Rudd states, he says, in like a dolphin pod or a wolf pack. And this is where all parts of the group need to be happy and healthy in order for the whole to be healthy. And you also see this in family systems theory in a what's called an open family system. It is where the the group is working for the benefit of the individuals. Um, in a closed family system, which is more on the shadow side of selfishness, the individual needs to work for the group. And so that's a lot where selfishness and the sacrificing comes from. There is also an ability of 
or an element of detachment when you know that other people can take care of themselves, that they are on their own journey and that you are holding this um, vision for them to feel empowered in this place and that they are ultimately responsible for themselves, but you can love them there and at the same time, you can take care of yourself there. Right? So there's a there's a there's a, a separation is not quite the right word, but there's an element of like of not being attached to the outcome of what the other person says. Now this is challenging because this is tribal energy and we're very much here in this place of like caring for our people, right? But when we can have this level of detachment, it really supports the other to feel empowered and not in victimization energy or disempowered, like they can't do it themselves. If you think of, if you've ever, um, trying to think of a movie or something, I see this a lot with my clients where people overfunction is a is a word in family systems theory where you you climb over onto someone else's side of the fence and you do all of the things that they need to do, whether it's a uh, um, you know, taking out the garbage or, or making their doctor's appointments or whatever it is. And then in that perception of wanting to help, it's actually a way to um, stuff your own anxiety down. And then it actually disempowers the other and the other doesn't need to take responsibility for themselves. And we actually want people to take responsibility for themselves, right? As well as, you know, sometimes our elderly or our young ones definitely need caring, right? But you're always caring for yourself too. So you can use this energy transit by asking yourself, what boundaries do you need to establish? Um, where might you be sacrificing yourself? And why, where might guilt be the driving force behind your actions? Um, as well as where do you see or perceive others to have less than you or are less fortunate? And how can you reframe that so that you both honor them and their stories and where they've come from and empower them at the same time? And you can also do that for yourself. So um, where do you see yourself to have less than or be less fortunate than others? And how can you reframe that so you can honor both your story and empower yourself? So my guides um, talk about this. Um, I channel uh, the Fae, I call them, and they are earthly um, fairy beings as well as cosmic fairy beings. And the Fae have said that this shadow is very, runs rampant on Earth. children who then are move into adults who were not raised in the safety of their parents and the homes that kept them secure because it's through security and it's through boundaries that children actually learn that they have something to push up against and they develop a sense of self and what they need and when I'm just reading my notes here. When we allow a child to find their own way while standing beside them and offering them your hand when they need it, this is a good struggle. This is them figuring it out themselves. And so when we allow our children to do that, and when we allow our people, so people that you care about, to, to struggle a little bit and say, hey, I'm here for a hug, or if you need support or an ear, but you don't do it for them, that is what strengthens those muscles of empowerment. Because if you look out into nature, everything in nature must struggle to find their power, to gain strength. If you've ever started seeds, um, seedlings inside, I did this for the first time last year, 
and I had all sorts of tiny little babies, baby lettuces and spinach and chard and everything. And um, you have to harden them. Um, and I think I put them outside in the in the sun and the wind for like a total of half an hour over like three days. And then I excitedly planted them in the garden and they promptly died because they'd been in perfect a perfect condition um, in my home, right? Where the temperature was regular, there was barely any breeze. I kind of had a fan going on them, but they didn't strengthen. And we need to be able to do that. Plants and trees and animals need to have a struggle in order to build that muscle because without empowerment, self-empowerment, you die. And humans don't often like to hear that because we care so much. But if you look everywhere in nature, that's what you'll find. And whether we recognize it or acknowledge it or not, we are a part of nature. And so when you enable other people to look for the for empower for some type of um, uh, something outside of themselves that perpetuates this this idea of selfishness on the shadow side, and it cultivates a weak community where people don't know how to stand in their truth, where they don't know how to stand in their integrity, where they don't need, know how to take care of themselves. And so we change all of this by becoming empowered, right? By creating boundaries for you, by sitting in the discomfort of feeling guilty because you're changing a family rule or a pattern in your life. Right? That discomfort, while it feels so uncomfortable, it actually strengthens you. It actually strengthens you to be able to take care of yourself and others more deeply. So I hope that resonated with you. Um, thank you so much for watching and wishing you well along this transit.